You guys ready to worship Jesus this morning? Well, we're going to sing. We're going to clap. We're also going to, I don't know how much of you do this regularly, but we're going to memorize some scripture this morning. Don't let that intimidate you. It's one verse. It's really simple. We're going to sing it a little bit later, but this is our call to worship today. Here's what Psalm 8 verse 9 says. It says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So that's what we're here to do. We're here to praise Jesus this morning. We're here to sing to him. We're here to declare that, how, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So let's sing together. Let's remember the gospel. Come on, let's, let's clap today. Let's sing in tenderness. In tenderness he sought me. Weary and sick with sin And on his shoulders brought me Back to his fold again While angels in his presence sang Until the courts of heaven rang oh, for me while I was sinning, needy and poor and blind. He whispered to assure me that I found thee, thou art mine. I've never heard a sweeter Worthy of every song we could ever 
ever seen Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say He's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Let's sing hold Holy, there is no one there is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me oh, Let's sing worthy of every song we could ever sing He's worthy of all the praise we could ever bring He's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, is worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. This is who he is. He's holy. There is no Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes. sing this together. I will build my life. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone. And I Come on, this is a good thing for us to sing this morning. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a well, we can trust Him.
give our God praise today. I said earlier, today we're going to memorize some scripture. It's the chorus of the song. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's one of the reasons why we sing um, when we gather together. It's to remember not just truth, but God's word. Um, so we hope this helps you to memorize the scripture. Mothers come adore his name. Sisters, raise your hands in praise. Lift your hand, taste and see all he's done. Heaven to earth has come. Fathers, shout the victor's cry. Brothers, feast upon his life. All is gone. Death has been overthrown. Mercy is on his throne. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. In all the year. Come on, let's sing. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the year. Yes, we kiss your name. 
majestic is your name in all sing it one more time majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Let's pray together. Um, and so, like I said, our, our church has given away a lot, um, and we, we gave to help plant that church in Ecuador a couple years ago, um, and so our team, we got to go, we got to see the building that was built, uh, we got to meet the pastors who are leading there, um, and we got to sit down with the pastors and just ask them a little bit about their experience. Um, so we have that video for you um, right now where we're going to show. So these are the pastors who, yeah, are leading the charge in Ecuador. Um, and it's in a, it's, they speak Spanish, so we have a translator that was translating real time, which is kind of like our whole experience in Ecuador. Uh, so you get to kind of experience what we experienced during our trip. So here's the video. Okay, mi nombre es eh, Rodrigo Mataylo Medina, ¿verdad? Tengo my name is Rodrigo Mataylo Medina. Tengo 44 años. I am 44 years old. Cuatro hijos. I have four kids. Cuatro nietos. Four grandsons, y grandkids. De, y de entre ellos, solo una nieta. And three of them are boys, one of them is a girl. Mi nombre es Angélica Sarango. My name is Angélica Sarango. Y como dijo mi esposo, pues nuestra familia es numerosa. And as I said, as my husband said, we have a numerous family. Estamos conformados por 12 personas. There's 12 people in my family. En, en mi caso, soy el pastor principal de, I'm the lead pastor of the church. De Centro Cristiano de Obra Pía. Christian Center of Obra Pía. That's the name of the church. Asumimos esta responsabilidad junto con mi esposa desde mediados de octubre. Me and my wife took this responsibility uh, mid-October of 2018. Actualmente vamos a cumplir seis meses ya como, como, como parte de Centro Cristiano de Obra Pía. At the moment, we've been pastoring for about six months. Pero el primer culto, el primer servicio como iglesia. But the first service that we had as a church. Lo hicimos el 10 de marzo. We did it on March 10th. Tenemos siete familias. We have seven families. Entre los cuales la mía es la mayoría. Amongst mine is the biggest one. Y somos alrededor de 25 personas. There's about 25 people that come. Eso es el servicio del domingo. Sí. El on Sunday domingo. service. Hmm? Bueno, eh, gracias a Dios la iglesia ha crecido mucho. That's where the uh, church has grown. Eh, tenemos eh, 142 niños. We are currently uh, serving 142 children. Y vienen eh, familias entre adultos. Estamos contando con, con 40 adultos. We have about 40 adults. Que vienen los días sábados. That come on Saturday. En donde damos talleres para los adultos. Where, do, where we do workshops for the adults. Y clases para los niños. And also classes for the children. Algo que me llamó la atención hoy. So, something that really got my attention. Fue de que una de las niñas que visitamos. Is that one of the girls that we visited today? Dice que cuando está en su casa. She said that when she's at home. Toma el nombre de mi esposa. She takes the name of my wife. Para simular una clase. To pretend that she's in a class. Que ella recibe. Acá. That she's teaching a class, a class that she received you. ¿Cómo no creer que Dios obra? How can we not believe that God is working? Si veo a niños. If I see kids. Veo a adultos. I, be, I see adults. Identificándose con nosotros. Identifying with us. Dios es muy bueno. God is so good. Pero sobre todo, but above everything, ha estado sosteniendo. He is, he's kept us. He's Yo kept sé que us. en cada casa, I know that in every household, en donde hemos llegado, where we've been to, su mano nos ha dado misericordia. His hand has given us mercy. Y la gente está mirando, and people are watching, que nuestro corazón es sincero. They're seeing that we have a sincere heart. Pero sobre todo, but above everything, que la presencia del Señor nos acompañe. That the presence of the Lord goes with us. Ver a las mamitas 
the, to, when we see the, the mothers que nos piden orar por ellos, when they ask us to pray for them ante cualquier necesidad, when they have any needs cuando están enfermas, when they're sick o cuando necesitan que alguien las abrace, or even when they just need a hug eh, nos buscan, they come look for us una excelente pregunta. an excellent question yo creo que una de las cosas que cada cristiano debería pedir and I believe one of the things that as Christians we should always ask es para que nuestros miembros is so that our members los de Centro Cristiano de members of our church Centro Cristiano de Europea sea gente llena del Espíritu Santo may they become people full of the Spirit no necesitamos más que eso that's all we need y su oración les pedimos and your prayers we ask for your prayers que sea enfocado a eso that you will pray towards that puedan orar por la idolatría. Hay idolatría. Pray for idolatry. There's a lot of idolatry in this area. Loja es una de las ciudades dentro del Ecuador. Loja is within Ecuador. Que es muy católica. Is one of the most most Catholic uh, cities. Y que tiene muchos muchas imágenes. And there's a lot of images. Por todo hacen imágenes. They do. They make an image for everything. Y tiene una gran necesidad espiritual. And they have a great spiritual need. Yo creo que debería comenzar por decirles gracias. The first thing that I could say is thank you. Sin ustedes esto no podría ser posible. Without you this could not be possible. Le doy toda la gloria y toda la honra a Dios. I give God all the glory and all the honor. Porque ha movido sus corazones. Because he's moved your hearts. Para que puedan bendecir nuestros niños. So you can bless our kids. Nuestro barrio. Our neighborhood. Nuestra ciudad. Our city. Y que gracias a ustedes, and it's because of you aunque estén ten, tan lejos, even though you're far away se cumple lo que dicen ellos. we can fulfill what uh, the book of Acts says Una iglesia unida, a united church en un solo sentir, in one heart y con un solo fin, and with one goal extender el Evangelio to de expand Señor the Jesus gospel of our Lord Jesus por Christ todo el mundo. all around the world y gracias por ese apoyo. and thank you for that support Los amamos de todo corazón. we love you from the bottom of our heart y les damos un abrazo grande. And we send a big hug. Y no se olviden de nosotros. And don't forget about us. Oren. Pray. Que Loja lo necesita. Because Loja needs it. Que Abrapía lo necesita. Abrapía needs it. Que nosotros lo necesitamos. We need it. Gracias. Thank you. It's pretty cool to see the actual physical place and hear from the actual pastors who are there. Um, so up here we have um, part of our Ecuador team. Um, so we have Ethan, Jamie, Tiffany, Kathy, and Efren. Um, and we've heard a little bit from the Ecuador team over the past month. Um, but yeah, we just want to ask some, well, I'll be asking some specific questions and just hearing their thoughts, their experience, um, because ultimately this wasn't just a trip for our team that went, but this is a trip that we want to bring back with, you, with us and share with you guys. And uh, we believe that God wants to speak to you um, as he did to us while we were there and even as we've come home. So um, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions and uh, the team's going to share their thoughts. Um, so yeah, it's going to be pretty chill. Um, so the first question I have is, what would you like to communicate to Grace City about sponsorship? All right, so going into this trip, I honestly had no idea who Compassion was or what they did. Um, but as you can see from this video, I had a similar experience where the people in this community just really touched my heart, whether it was the church staff or the home visits we went on, meeting the families and playing with the kids. It was just um, an amazing eye-opener to me about how Um, valuable it is to enter in relationships with people, not only just in our families or friend circles, um, sometimes we bridge out to our workplace or our community, um, but personally I know I tend to forget like there's a whole world out there and there's so many people, um, and yes they're very far away, but we're still all one body of Christ, and so it's just really rewarding to be able to um, engage in relationship with them, um, and compassion is a perfect way to do this. Um, I sponsor two kids, and I've sponsored them for about a month now, and just exchanging letters already, I can just tell how rewarding of an experience it's going to be um, as we continue to grow in our relationship. Um, so I realize sometimes financially it's hard to budget for that, but um, one sponsorship is $38 a month, and the way it was explained to me, I really valued. Um, basically, that's a little over a dollar a day, so you're basically giving up like a fancy coffee drink a week, which when you look at it that way, it doesn't seem like a huge deal, right? So um, I just challenge you all to 
think about this and uh, pray into this. And whether or not you decide to sponsor today, just um, come check us out um, outside there and um, ask some questions. And yeah. Hi, so I sponsored a child in the original sponsorship day like a year and a half ago. And beyond um, like the monthly financial support and the few letters a year, I didn't really know what sponsorship like really was. So I wanted to share that with you all. And so we got the opportunity to experience it there. And one of the things that they do for each sponsored child is they keep um, a tangible record of all their medical history, their family history, um, their school history. Um, just they like keep a really tight touch on um, each child's life, which is really cool and they um, continuously like check in with that child. Um, and beyond sponsoring that specific child, um, sponsoring a child means helping the Compassion Center at that church. And so what's really cool that I didn't realize is um, Compassion partners with the churches in the area, but the community doesn't see Compassion, they just see the church plant. So what that means is that Compassion trains these church plants to become successful churches and really grounded. And so the children and community um, that aren't part of the Compassion program are still heavily impacted by um, the church plant there. Um, for example, there is 144 kids um, that go to that church, but not all of them are sponsored, but all of them receive the benefits of having just like a grounded community to be with. And a lot of the kids that we hung out with when we were there were not specifically sponsored kids per se, which is interesting. Um, and I just want to highlight that sponsorship goes beyond financial support. When I first um, sponsored my sponsor child, um, I saw f just the poverty and I was like, all right, uh, financial support is like forefront. That's really important. Um, and what I've been like learning is that the emotional support and just the letter writing specifically is just um, so impactful. Um, as far as the children are concerned, like their first experience with um, their sponsor is the letters. Like they do all the background work, like the, the medical and the tutors and everything to support them, but the, ki the kids just see the letters. Um, and there is a statistic that only 30% of the kids actually like receive letters from their sponsors, even though they're like required to write to their sponsors. So it can be really emotionally tiring for the kids themselves to write letters to people that never respond to them. Um, so I just want to really highlight like it's more than just writing a check every month. It's really investing in these children and especially like when they enter the program, they're around three to five years old and you're committing to being a part of their lives until they age out, which is around 18. So that's like 15 years. Um, so it's like a big privilege and a big responsibility. Um, so I just like am urging you all to pray um, and think about whether you're able to do both the finances and the emotional investment in these children. It's like a really beautiful opportunity, um, but I don't think it should be taken lightly. Um, so, and also like these children, they consider you your, their family. Like as soon as, like for a lot of us, they like called us like great or like godmother or like sister or brother. Um, and so it's a big emotional investment. Like it's like adopting a child into your family and like they consider you as such. So you should do the same for them. Um, and these children are like beyond like the pictures that you see on the envelopes outside. They're like very real and tangible and they have the capacity to love you all so much. Um, so I urge you to like pray and see if this is something that God is urging you to do because it's a really beautiful privilege. Yeah, it's, it was really amazing. It really came to life being able to go and visit and see their home, meet their family, be like, wow. I mean, I was convicted about the letter writing thing. It's like, man, I think we wrote like on her birthday and Christmas, but like, I want, it made me want to write more, like knowing like she really cares about that. And it's important. A lot of children don't have people saying that they believe in them or that they even love them. Um, so, yeah, that was one of my biggest takeaways from the trip was write letters to your kid because it's so vital. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the next question here. Um, 
What did God show you about his kingdom by going on this trip? Um, so the first thing we did when we went there, um, like to the church that we stayed at for a couple of days, um, we did home visits. So when they do home visits, um, I think like once a week or something like that, uh, or a couple times a week, and um, whether they show up to church or not or through the program at all, they'll still check up on them and make sure that they're okay. Um, cause if a kid doesn't show up to church, they, they start worrying like, Hey, what's going on? Like are the parents, um, not being able to transport them to church or whatever that case may be. Um, and home visits are super important because, um, the first one we went to, it was, uh, one of the guys from, uh, Ohio from Good News Church, Cody, um, when we went, they were kind of like, uh, I don't know if uh, this is a good idea or not, but um, we kind of just like went there. The kid was super excited, but the parents was like a little like worried at all because the Catholic church said some other things about us going on to the trip. So uh, when we went, we kind of just got to know each other um, and it was super cool because at first they were kind of like not wanting to talk to us that much. And then later on, they were super happy, wanting to take pictures and everything. And when he was talking to him, like, oh, this is my daughter, this is my wife, they were just like, yeah, I know. We see all the letters. So, like, the letters are super important, um, like they were saying. And um, they basically knew what they all looked like, how old they were, their names and stuff like that. So it was really cool. And the kid, when he asked when, uh, where the letters were, the kid went right to the letters and got them. It was really cool. Um, so it was just, like, us going to their house was just showing love to them, not like trying to do anything other than that. And I think the parents seen that and the you know, love that Jesus has for us, um, we're just spreading that love with them. And I think that made them um, realize that more. Um, and the church itself, um, it's such a cool atmosphere. Like everyone's super like energetic and joyful. And um, we had a lot of games there, so it was really fun. And one of the biggest things was, like, being able to see how, like, the church, they, I don't know, for us, we were kind of just going with the flow, but they were running things, like, so smooth. It was crazy. And um, when we um, went to the church, they, um, I don't forget what I was saying. Sorry. <laughs> um, oh, they had, like, these uh, documents for each kid to figure out who, what kids are, have, like, if they have a, problem with like hospital or anything like medical or information about their family and stuff so it's really cool how organized they are um and let me see one thing oh their prayer their prayers is super simple like they don't ask for anything like fancy or anything they just simply ask that you pray that jesus is walking with them and then god god would provide for them um i we've seen some pictures um when they first started it was just like a cornfield basically they leveled it out and they built a one story. Um, when we were there, we helped like move the rocks so the kids wouldn't get like sand in their eyes. Um, and now they want us to pray that um, they have a second story because there's not there's too many kids and family that they need bigger space. So they they want to build a second story, and um, I think I, they're gonna do it. You know, God's gonna provide for them, and you know, God is good. So and yeah, when we go back, it'd be cool to see that second story. Yeah, it was cool on our last night with the church. We got to go up on the roof and pray for that second story. And uh, we just got a cool view of the city, and we got to pray for the city that uh, Jesus' name and his love would be known there. So it was really cool. Yeah, it'll be neat to see um, down, the, down the road what that second st story looks like because, I mean, kids literally couldn't even fit all in the building. There are so many, which is amazing. Um, the next question is, why do you think it's important for us to see what God is doing in other areas of the world? Well, first, let me just go ahead and start. Um, going into this um, mission trip, I was just full of excitement because, yes, I got to visit my sponsored child, but as you found out, that didn't happen for um, certain reasons. But um, And as well, I just wanted to go and serve. I wanted to teach um, in like what I know to a church that I thought that was in need. But upon our arrival, um, what blew my mind is that God was already moving within that church. 
And we didn't have to teach them anything. They had things down packed. They had um, the gospel moving. All the, um, the staff there was like on fire, so organized. And what was amazing is that we just had to come alongside them, uh, you know, and work as a big family. Um, their thing over there is hugging and family. So by the end of the trip, you'll definitely be hugging people like crazy. But um, is the gospel. The gospel, no matter where you're at, if you're here in Universal City, La Jolla, Ecuador, or Tokyo, Japan, the gospel is solid and it is moving. And to see that in um, Ecuador was amazing that no matter where you are, the gospel is moving and that we're just one family that comes alongside them. So seeing that and over there was a big impact that we didn't have to do anything for them. We just had to just keep on praying. And just what their thing for us is to just pray. And prayer does many things. Awesome. And the last question is, if someone wants to take a next step in mission or sponsorship, what would you say to them? Yeah, so if someone's interested in kind of taking the next step in mission, um, probably a couple things I would say. One would be, uh, just stay sensitive to God's leading and stay open to him. I think doing an exposure trip like this one is an awesome way to just kind of see what the world is like outside of what you've experienced and see what God is doing in different cultures. Uh, I was just blown away, like other people have said, with the staff at the church, uh, with the love that they have for the kids and just the incredible work that they're doing for the gospel there. So it's really cool to see. And also say just be, be faithful where you're at. You know, if, if you're really interested in mission or in taking the next step in ministry, uh, God's put you in places right where you're at as an employee or student or, or whatever your life stage is, uh, where you have chances to serve God right now. Uh, so I think every time that I go overseas on a mission trip, that's one of the things that I learn. It's like I don't have to go there to like be serving God. Like He's given me those opportunities where I'm at. Um, and if you're interested in sponsorship, uh, I think obviously today is an awesome opportunity to go and uh, check out some of the packets, um, see some of the kids that you could be sponsoring. Um, I definitely encourage you. It's one of those things, again, like other people have said, it's um, a, a sacrifice that you're making, but I think for a lot of us, uh, we're very blessed financially, and so that's, that's not a, a huge sacrifice, and you're making a really, really big impact on a child as well as their family. Um, it was cool, on the last day that we were uh, in Loja, we had like a fun day for all the little kids, went to the water park, and you saw that at the beginning of the video there, going down the slides and all that fun stuff, so. Uh, at the end of the, the fun day, um, we were saying goodbye to our sponsored child, and uh, her cousin kind of helps take care of her because the you know, family situation's in the rough. But um, when we were saying goodbye to her, the, the cousin just breaks down in tears. She's like, thank you so much for all that you do. I was like, <laughs> you know, we're just like, we barely do anything. Like, we're just, you know, sponsoring your child and, and write the letters and stuff. But, like, it's, it's our pleasure. It just means so much. Uh, to her, to, to have us come alongside their family and, and help take care of the, the little kids. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so, yeah, like we mentioned, we have those packets today. We have 78 packets. Um, and I'm praying that they all get taken. Um, and so we'll have those over the next couple of weeks. Um, but really, like, uh, I think a common theme is, like, pray about it. Um, and I think a lot of times there can be, like, fear wrapped up in making a decision like that. Um, so I just pray that you... Um, you choose faith over fear um, and, and see what God can do with it. So um, go ahead and give it up for our Ecuador team. Um, so we're going to read scripture now. Um, if you want to pull up Mark 6, 30 through 44, Randall's going to come up after I read this and give a little sermon. If you need a, to borrow a Bible, we have some in the auditorium or in the foyer, uh, or we'll have it on the screen as well. All right, so this is Mark 6, 30 through 44. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. 
And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And he took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. All right, let us pray together. Lord, uh, we are in awe of what you're doing around the world. Um, We are in awe of who you are and your heart, your love for people, your love for justice and for, for meeting the needs of the poor we thank you that as your church, you invite us into that. Lord, I just pray that our hearts would be aligned with yours. Lord, that if it's on anyone's heart today uh, to sponsor a child, Lord, that you would continue to speak through them throughout this service. Lord, I pray that we would have open hands and open hearts. pray that you'd speak through Randall today as he, as he teaches from your word. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, good morning. You out there? Compassion Sunday? All right, yeah, this is a great Sunday. You know, for us as a church body, uh, I want us to think about this. Uh, We were a church plant that started in 2015, and by God's grace, we were able to help be a part of a church plant that started um, in Ecuador. And so we've been able to journey along with this church plant as they've been planted, and now we are here. um, and, And... you know, the thing that I, I love about Compassion, I was able to take a trip in 2015, um, really right, right around the time we were going, and, and, and I, I, it just hit my heart about what God was doing there. And so I got to meet uh, some pastors there. Uh, as I was there, Pastor Felix and Pastor David. And, and so we were able to talk a little bit about what God was doing in Ecuador and, and then being able to just say, you know what, we're going to make a decision. We're going to make a pact on what we're going to do uh, from this point. And so uh, me, along with some other pastors, said, you know what, we want to be a part of planting a church. And so this was the night that we came together and we said, you know, we are going to commit together to, to trust God that he's going to provide so that we can help plant this church out here in Ecuador. And God did. And so just us as a small little church, church plant, being able to come together and say, we're going to give $15,000 to help start this church. And the beauty of it is, as we grow and as they grow, um, our kids and our, and our families are able to see that too. And so uh, me and my family have two uh, children there that we sponsor in Ecuador, a little boy and a little girl. And, and the reason is, is because I want my kids to be able to see that, right? And so as we grow, we want to grow in our compassion. Um, but the question is, well, what is compassion, what is that? And so today we're going to be looking at Mark 6, 30 through 44. And the, the message is the compassion of Jesus. The compassion is of Jesus. Um, you know, the world, uh, I looked at the, this definition of what they say what compassion is, right? The definition of compassion. And here's the definition. The, the sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. And there's this debate, right? Like, what is uh, compassion truly? Is it, is it um, just a sympathy? Is it just I feel bad about the situation that, that people are in, that they're suffering, and so I feel bad inside about that? Or is compassion something more? Well, today we have to look at how does Jesus define compassion. And so that's our text from Mark 6, 30 through 44. And this passage of scripture is very important for the church because this is the feeding of the 5,000. It's, it's a miracle that happens. And it is mentioned in all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so the frequency of this story shows that there's an importance to the account that happened here for the church. We need to learn something from this because helping the poor and hurting has always been a staple of God's church. 
You know, um, the Apostle Paul, God radically saves him in the book of Acts, and then he starts to preach the gospel. And, and, and one of the things that he does is he goes before the other apostles and he preaches the gospel to them. And he wanted to test to make sure that what he was saying was right. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. He died for our sins. All of those things, theologically correct. But do you know what the apostle said to him after he, he shared that with him? It says this, that in Galatians 2.10, the apostle Paul says that they asked us to remember the poor. And the apostle Paul says it was the very thing we were eager to do. Right? We can have right theology, right biblical doctrine, all of these things. But if we don't have a heart to help the lost and to help those that Jesus has a heart for, then it doesn't match up. Right? Gospel preaching, but also gospel response. Good news response. And so what can we learn from the compassion of Jesus from today's text? Well, there are three parts to it. And I want to give you all three from today's text. It's number one, it's knowing that Jesus sees. Jesus sees. Number two, that Jesus empathizes. And number three, that Jesus responds. Right, as we think about compassion today, let our focus be on Jesus. And so number one, Jesus sees. Look at verses 30 through 34. It says, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. <clears throat> and they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. Now, there are two things that are happening. First, we see that uh, Jesus' disciples had just done a lot of ministry, and so they were excited about that. They were telling that to Jesus, but Jesus says, you have to rest, and so we got to get away. And so he gets in the boat, he takes them away, but what happens is the crowd starts to follow them. The crowd sees them. And so as Jesus, in verse 34, along with his disciples, come ashore, I got it out there, ashore, uh, he saw a great crowd. Now here's what we need to know. Jesus, at this point, along with his disciples, were tired. They were hungry. And that is the state in which Jesus sees this crowd. Now, I don't know about you, but when I am tired and hungry, and I see that there's more things to do, you know, they've invented a word for this. It's hangry. You get hangry when you see that there's more things to do on the list, but you're tired and you're hungry and you're at the end of yourself. See, what the Bible tells us and what the Bible should show us is this, that we are a lot more like the disciples who are struggling, stumbling along than we are like Jesus. See, Jesus is the hero. He's always the hero of the story. Because as Jesus is in this place of hunger and being tired, and he sees the crowd, it says that he has compassion on them. Jesus is the hero. See, more than 65 years ago, Everett Swanson, who was a pastor, uh, he started Compassion International. But this is the story behind it. He flew from Chicago to South Korea to minister to American troops fighting in the Korean War. Now, during that time, he grew increasingly troubled by the sight of hundreds of orphans, uh, war orphans living on the streets, abandoned by society. And one morning, he saw city uh, workers scooping up what looked like piles of rags and tossing them into the back of a truck. As he walked closer to the truck, he was horrified to see that these piles of rags were frozen bodies of orphans who had died overnight in the streets. See, God had to take him a little closer though. Because, you know, from a distance you can see that, but, but what happened was he was out eating one day and his, he put his jacket on the back of his seat and there was 
a child who ran up, snatched his jacket, and ran away. Well, Mr. Swanson ran after this child because that was his jacket. So he saw on a porch his jacket sitting there. And so what he did, he, he came up to it, he took the jacket, and he found the little boy huddled with his little brother underneath this jacket. Swanson could not turn his back on these unwanted children and vowed to help them any way he could. You see, when Jesus sees, even at the end of himself, it says that Jesus shows compassion. And as Jesus comes into our lives, he takes us to those places that we don't want to see. Right, because let's be honest, there are places that we want to avoid, we don't want to talk about, because it's uncomfortable. I was talking with a friend recently who helps uh, children who are trafficked, and he rescues them out of slavery. And I said, how do you go into those places? That's just got to be one of the scariest things. He says it is, but it's Jesus who takes me to those places. To see it the hurting, the pain that people go through. See, here's the truth. Our only hope is that Jesus sees, he sees the crowd, he sees the suffering, and he's willing to engage the hurting, the lonely, the lost, the messy places in this world and in our lives. See, Jesus doesn't run from those messy places even within our own hearts, those sinful places. Secondly, what we see is this, that Jesus empathizes. Verse uh, 34 into verse 37, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And, and when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? So verse 34 says that Jesus shows this compassion to the crowd. Now the word that's used for compassion is splognizomai. It's a long word. But, but here's what it is. It, it, this word should stick with us because what it means is that Jesus was moved to the deepest part of himself. It, they would use this term to their bowels, to their innermost parts. They were moved because in the bowels, in that deepest part was where that was the seat of love, of love. See, this is the deepest place of emotion that Jesus empathizes with the people. As he looks at people suffering, hurting, the crowd, he doesn't just see the crowd, but he sees the people in the crowd. See, what does Jesus see? Well, it says this. It says, they were like sheep without a shepherd. Like sheep without a shepherd. James Brooks says, instead of being angry with the people for for preventing the much needed rest, Jesus had compassion on them. The word compassion is used in the New Testament only by or about Jesus. That word splagnizomai is only used about Jesus. See, Jesus was moved deeply because of the lostness of the people he saw. And so how does Jesus have compassion on the people? Well, his first response is this, to teach them many things. To teach them many things. Matthew 4.4 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by the, every word that comes from the mouth of God. That God's word is important for our lives. You know, I talked with Eric, who's one of my friends. He's one of the directors at Compassion International. And the phrase for Compassion International for, for their, their tagline is this, rescuing children from poverty in Jesus' name. And he said, we've had many people that have come to us and said, you know, if you just removed the name Jesus, we would have sponsored you. We would have given you so much more money. Just all you had to do was remove the name Jesus. But he said, Jesus is the only reason that we're doing this. 
Jesus is the one that's shown us the compassion to go out and love the world. And so as a company, he said, we will never remove the name of Jesus because it's always about him. And see, the only way that we could get into Loha was that there was a church that was planted there because they worked through the local church. That's the thing I love about compassion so much is that the church and the message of Jesus is priority. Secondly, Jesus wanted to meet the physical needs. And so this is interesting. I love this interaction here. It says, when it grew late, the disciples, they're getting practical. This is a desolate place. We're out in a desert. There's a, the, the hour is now late. Send them away. Go into the surrounding countryside. Let them go buy something for themselves. But do you get Jesus' response here? This is so funny. He says in verse 37, you give them something to eat. Do something about it. Respond to it. Like you see that they have a need. Do something. And here's their response. Shall we go buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? Here's the thing about the denarii. A denarii was about one day's wage. So it would have been 200 days wages that a two-thirds, right, of my salary to go buy people something to eat today. Now why did Jesus respond like this? Because he purposely places the disciples in this impossible situation. They're in this impossible situation. Why? So that they know the means to do this can only come from God. See, many times what we think is it's got to be me who accomplishes this. It's got to be me who figures out a solution. It's got to be me who fixes a problem. But what Jesus is saying is, no, I'm the only one who can do it. And so... I'm just going to push you into this corner so you can see that it's only me who can provide. And what it does is also pulls out the excuses that we make for not showing compassion, right? The excuses are like, you know, I remember my wife, before she was my wife, was like, hey, you got to go on a mission trip. You got to go see what's going on in the world and what God's doing. And so I remember every excuse in the book that I would use. I was like, you know, I just can't afford it. I was a college student. I'm just like, just can't, it's not going to make, I can't make this happen. And then, you know, by the end of the day, I ran out of excuses and I went and God changed my life. Went to the poorest country in the Western hemisphere, Haiti. It was just like, my mind was blown, right? The, the, but sometimes you got to be pushed into these situations where you know that it can't be on your strength, but only on God's. Lastly, Jesus responds, Look at verses 38 through 44. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. So they found out they f five, and, uh, five and two fish. He commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. They sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. Verse 42, they all ate and were satisfied. They took up the baskets full of broken pieces and of fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So what we know is this, that it was 5,000 men that are counted, but there were more women and children on top of that. So this was even more miraculous than 5,000 that were fed that day. And here's the two things that we need to learn from this. The first one is this, that Jesus takes the little and makes much. He takes the little and makes much. So what he did was he gathered what was there? And they put it in the hands of Jesus. Here's the thing that I, I've, I've realized over the years. When I think that I have very little, God shows me that I have much more than I thought I had. I have much more than I thought I had. See, God has provided much more than I think. For many of us, we live in this scarcity mindset that there's just never gonna be enough and we can live in that mindset our whole lives. Or we can take the little that we have and place it in the hands of Jesus and say, Jesus, change my mind, change my heart, change who I am. And so that's what Jesus does is he takes the little and makes much. But secondly, it's this, that Jesus satisfies beyond physical satisfaction, right? It's not just the material blessings of we just got fed today, but it's so much more than that because verse 42 tells us that. It says, and they all ate and were satisfied. 
Commentator James Brooks says again, Mark probably wanted readers and hearers to think in terms of something more than physical satisfaction from all that Jesus gives. Right? It's not just the physical thing. And even as you heard the testimonies from people up here, it wasn't just the physical that was being fixed, but it's also the spiritual and all of these other things that are fulfilled when Jesus provides. And so quickly, let's end with two takeaways. The first one is this. Rest in what Jesus has done. Rest in what Jesus has done. Think about this. Jesus' disciples come up to him and they're telling him all the things that they've done. And the work was still not over. It still wasn't over. And Jesus says, you know what? You guys, instead of focusing on what you're doing, you need to come rest. You need to come rest. And that's the same thing for you and me. Here's the, here's the, the reality. Jesus is always the hero. Many times we want to put on the cap of, I'm the savior and I'm going to go try and save the world. I'm going to go do all of these things to, to fix the world. And what we do is we place the responsibility on our shoulders. But the, the gospel truth, the good news is this, that there's only one savior and his name's Jesus. And so as we rest in him, that's the first step. Because we will burn ourselves out if we think that we can go save the world. But the second part is this, respond because of what he's done. Respond because of what he's done. Right, it's, it's hearing the good news, it's knowing the good news, but knowing that I need God's strength to go follow through on it. And so respond on what Jesus has done. True compassion grows out of a relationship with Jesus. As my heart starts to become more like Jesus and he starts to take me to those places that I'm like, I don't want to see that. But he starts to bring it to light, whether it be in your own life or whether it be in the world. You start to be a beacon of light in those places that are dark. You start to respond because you say, God, how are you asking me to respond in this place? Not to just overlook it, but to do something. Here's the good news today. It's that as Jesus looked down from the cross, instead of ignoring, instead of walking away, instead of doing everything that, that would have made sense, because even people shouting at him saying, hey, get off of that cross, because if you were really the son of God, you would get yourself off of the cross. Instead of leaving, he stayed. Why? It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And here's what we believe as Christians. Here's what I invite you to if you've never believed in Christ today. Is that this great act of compassion, the greatest act of compassion that the world has ever seen, as God died for you and me, it starts to change our hearts. And our hearts start to become more like his because of what he's done. Because of what he's done. And so what is the compassion of Jesus? Look to the cross. Look to what he's done for you. And let your love grow for him and it will grow for others. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you that you ultimately have finished it. It is done. And so you are the light of the world. And I pray, God, that we trust in your light and what you've done and that your compassion fills our lives because, Jesus, you died for us. And so we can show compassion to others who need it the most, that are lost, that are hurting that are broken. It's not just people in Ecuador, it's people in our city, it's people in our community. It might be even us right now that's sitting in brokenness. And so Lord, we just thank you that when you see us, you have compassion on us. Help us to remember that good news today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You know, the, the thing that Jesus said on the cross just sticks with me. He says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgive them for they know not what they do. And you know, there are times where I doubt and I fear and I struggle. And the beauty of it is, is that we can come to the foot of the cross and know that it's healed, know that it's forgiven, know that we're free. And so today we, we take communion every week to remind ourselves of the good news of the gospel, that God has come and he's shown great compassion to us in our hurt and our pain. And so when you take the bread today and you take the juice, 
Remember what he's done. So I invite you today, if you're a believer in Christ, to do that. And, you know, if you're not a believer yet, to, to, to really just process and take it in and just pray and say, what's holding me back? But we'd love to talk to you about that as well at the end of service. So when you're ready, you can come and take communion. Look what God has done He redeemed us with His blood We were lost and dead in sin He came for us Look what God has done He adopted us in love We were orphans without hope Now His children are we that he would save us? Who are we that he would send us? To God be glory, through Christ our Savior's church, through all generations. God be glory through Christ our Savior's work forever and ever look what God has done through his sacrifice we're one Sinners unified by grace, bound together. Look what God has done by His Spirit through His Son. By the power of His hand, He is sending. Who are we that He would save us? Oh, oh.
Amen. Um, if I could invite the care team to come down. Um, They'll be available after service if you'd like to receive prayer. Um, and so I just want to encourage you guys. I hope that uh, this whole service was encouraging to you as we just think about uh, the world and what God's doing um, and how we can come into that. Um, so if you are interested in sponsoring a child, we have these uh, child packets outside right as you leave. There's 78 of them, and I'm praying that all of them get taken today. Um, so this is Brittany right here. Um, her birthday's pretty close to mine. Uh, so if you like that, um, if you want to, you know, sponsor a kid that's on your birthday or close to your birthday, uh, you can see that, and that's kind of fun to to have that in common with them. Um, it's it's thirty eight dollars a month. Um, you can do an additional seven dollars a month too if you want to uh, support compassion to a, a wider degree. Um, yeah, and so I encourage you take a look. Uh, even if you're on the fence, just go go over there, look at the pictures. It kind of changes your heart a little bit when you see them. Um, so I'm going to pray for us, um, and then we'll, we'll be done. Lord, I just thank you for today. Um, God, I thank you for opportunity to, to step into your mission. Um, Lord, I just pray that each person here today leaves with one thing that you've laid on their heart. Um, and I thank you that you are at work Thank you that you're at work here, you're at work in Ecuador, um, and we get to partner with them. It's a joy, Lord. Um, in your name we pray. Amen. All right, Grace City, you are sent.